Coming up next on this edition of In the City, with the holidays right around the corner, so is winter weather advisories. We'll give you some helpful advice on how to stay safe this season. And the Murfreesboro Transportation Department could be making some noticeable improvements at multiple locations throughout the city. Plus, one Murfreesboro City School teacher receives a state honor. But first, there's some updates in regards to the Murfreesboro 2035 campaign and how you can get involved in deciding the city's future. All this and more coming up right now on this edition of In the City. Welcome to another edition of In the City, your source for what's happening right here in the city of Murfreesboro. I'm Callie Durham. Well, Murfreesboro is continuing its efforts to bring citizens a 20-year comprehensive plan by rolling out the first chapter this month. Murfreesboro hired Kendig Keys Collaborative to put together the plan and has already held a community kickoff event back in August where the city began formulating ideas with citizens in the community to see where the city's urban development plans should be headed. The comprehensive plan itself will be a roadmap for the city's future. It will detail necessary plans for the areas that need improvement in order for the city to keep up with its growing population. The next step in the process will be a meeting held on December 8th where Kendig Keys Collaborative will present the first chapter of the plan to the city's task force, which is made up of area citizens and local business people who serve as the first line of review and feedback in developing the plan. The first chapter will be presented to the general public on December 9th at a community meeting beginning at 5.30 p.m. in the auditorium of Oakland Middle School. The second chapter of the plan is currently being developed, but it is set to be presented to the community this January, and it will cover the topic of growth capacity. The plan will be compiled of ideas generated from the community, so public input is essential in forming the most effective plan. If you're interested in getting involved in the planning process and want to add your concerns or suggestions, you can visit the Comprehensive Plans online discussion forum at murfreesboro2035.com and sign up for a free account so that you can add to the conversation. If you've already made an account, then simply log in and add your comment to any of the ongoing topics of discussion. New topics are posted in the forum every few weeks, so please continue to check back and give your suggestions and advice to further assist in forming the comprehensive plan for our city's future. At Murfreesboro2035.com, you can also learn more about the comprehensive plan, watch informational videos, or find out more about what exactly an online discussion forum is and how to leave your feedback. You can even see who's reading the online discussion topics, including council members and city department heads. There's still time to participate and put in your two cents, so make sure to take advantage of these resources. For more information, you can sign up for the project's newsletter at 2035newsletter.com. You can also email borough2035 at murfreesboro.tn.gov or call the city manager's office at 615-849-2629. Murfreesboro will be making improvements to two busy roads to better assist both motorists and pedestrians. Braveville Pike is a project we've been working on since approximately 2011. It is a project that goes from Southeast Broad Street to Rutherford Boulevard and is about uh, 2.1 miles. Currently Braveville Pike is just a two-lane road. It's an old state route. It's been around forever. Uh, it's got ditches and uh, lax sidewalks and some other elements that are part of normal urban design. And moving forward with the project, uh, we would plan to expand this road for a three-lane road that would be uh, two lanes and a center turn lane. In addition, we are adding the bicycle lanes for this project to uh, tie to the Middle Tennessee Boulevard uh, bike lane pass and also uh, to implement part of our uh, bicycle master plan. In addition to that, uh, we would be employing sidewalks that would provide a pedestrian pass up and down the road that would connect the uh, residential areas back to the commercial areas and also provide a better path for our public transit system that already operates along that route. One other element of the project would be to install some additional uh, transit shelters along the route as that is on one of our uh, rover routes 
that would provide uh, better accessibility to the public use that system as well. We are hoping to have uh, this to construction sometime in 2017. There's still a lot of process left to undergo in a federally funded project, uh, but uh, we are pursuing that in the design public meeting is basically just one element of that process moving toward a construction of the project. Well, certainly one of the uh, primary objectives of any transportation project is the improvement of safety, but uh, I think this is elevated in that status as we do have a lot of uh, residential uh, development around the area. There are a lot of people that walk up and down Bradable Pike without adequate shoulders or sidewalks and such. This would really help improve the safety of the residents that live in the area. Uh, the Cherry Lane Extension Project is a project uh, that first showed up in the city's major thoroughfare plan back in 2003. Uh, since 2005, we have actually been pursuing what it, we were referring to as phase three of this project. This is a three-phase project. Phase one has already been constructed. That is the part between Memorial Boulevard and the end of Siegel Park, which is a four-lane median divided highway. Phase two is under design. That would go cross-country from the uh, termini of phase one or the end of Siegel Park all the way to Sulphur Springs Road uh, and that is a locally funded city project. Phase three is a project that would pick up where phase two leaves off at Sulphur Springs Road and go westward toward uh, Northwest Broad Street and connect to that. This would also include an interchange uh, at State Route 840. The roadway that we're uh, talking about is a five-lane road with bike lanes and sidewalks, more of an urban type of roadway. This roadway is something that the city uh, has seen as a definite need, not only for the immediate uh, traffic congestion relief, but also as the northern part of Murfreesboro continues to grow. This provides really a parallel route to Thompson Lane. Uh, Thompson Lane, parts of that are, are pretty congested. Uh, we're trying to provide some relief for that in conjunction with actually widening Thompson Lane. So when we look out to 25 or 30 years, I think the opinion is that uh, we don't need one road or the other, but we need to improve Thompson Lane to a five lane road, but also build the Cherry Lane extension. So that is a project uh, that's been the subject of a public meeting. We're taking public input and trying to move forward with our plans based on comments that we receive from the public as well uh, as other elements of the environmental study, which this is uh, currently in now. One of Murfreesboro's own city school teachers is gaining a state recognition, and she tells us what it takes to truly make a difference. Christy Mall teaches third grade to gifted and high achieving students at the Discovery School and has recently won the Teacher of the Year Award from the Tennessee Association of the Gifted. I am just so flattered that I won the award because it's something that I'm very passionate about and I've really invested a lot of time and training and to become a better teacher for the gifted. So by becoming more active, I became an advocate for gifted needs and now I'm helping people all over the state and doing this work with gifted kids that I just love. So the fact that I won an award in something that I'm so incredibly passionate about it, it was great and it was I didn't even know I was nominated for it so I, I was so shocked. Christy says there's so much more that goes into being a great educator than what you may see in a classroom. You've got to be willing to go above and beyond and that's one of the first things. I recognized after my training that there was a world out there and instead of sitting back and waiting you know for a conference to come here or for training to come to me, I started finding opportunities so that I could become better. And the more I learned, the more I realized I needed to learn. In addition to Christie's determination and ambitious nature, she also has a personal connection that has helped her to become a better teacher and advocate for her students. I have a 16-year-old daughter that is gifted, and she was very precocious, very linguistic. And so she was so far ahead verbally and written was that when I had my second child, who's five years younger, his language skills were um, very slow to develop. And I remember going to the pediatrician and saying, you know, I'm worried, I'm concerned. I've had some kids with autism and I'm thinking he's got some characteristics like autism. And thank goodness um, I was able to go to Vanderbilt and get him diagnosed. And working with a child with autism that's in your own home. Like I had worked with students and I mean, thank goodness for that because that's how I spotted it in him. 
but working with a child with autism 24-7 is completely different than having them in the classroom. And I am so thankful that teaching led me to getting a diagnosis for him and him having autism has made me a better teacher because it's really helped me understand the needs of special ed students and for the parents too. It really helped me understand what they were going through, but it also helped me understand how to make changes and differentiate for children in a way that they would be more successful. And to the point now where I have kids with learning disabilities in my classroom all the time, and they'll have the best year, and it's because I'm so used to automatically modifying for my own son. Chrissy's hard work and dedication to shaping future generations can be seen in the joy and fulfillment that she brings to her students' lives. It's a blessing. There are so many jobs that are out there where people go to work and they feel like they don't make a difference in the world, and I know every single day that I'm making a difference in a child's life, which is both amazing and overwhelming responsibility at the same time. So I just try to be as positive and as good a role model for them as I can be, plus pushing them to be better and kind of break out of the box, break out of the mold. Don't be afraid to be who you are. And so I just, I love that that's what I get to do every single day is to come to work and change lives. Every year, time and money is donated to giving food and other essential items to those in need. But have you ever thought about how those same needy families are able to have basic necessities, like utilities? We have so many people that come in to the electric department that, that you know, they're almost in tears. And they, they can't pay their electric bill. They have a very high electric bill. You know, they'll have no insulation. You know, they're just, you know, it's almost impossible, impossible for them to conserve on their electric bill. You know, they, they're, they're running their heat. They have very inefficient heating sources, they have no insulation in the walls, and their electric bills are skyrocketing. The Murfreesboro Electric Department is teaming up with community helpers to provide more families in need with electricity. Murfreesboro Electric's Magic Dollar Program is where our customers can donate a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, whatever amount they want to their electric bill. And every month we will bill that. It'll be a line item on their bill that says Magic Dollar and then the amount. And then we take all that money and we give that to community helpers and community helpers will give that out to people in our community that will need help with their electric bill or, or other things. So it's a great way to give back, a very easy way to give back, and even a dollar can help. Ann tells us that sometimes people say, well, someone may have made a bad choice in their life, but community helpers actually sees a lot of people that are really good people but have had bad things happen to them. Whether it's a death in the family, their child is sick, or they've lost their job, they're just going through a really hard time. Community Helpers receives the vast majority of its funds that go toward helping those in need from personal donations like the Magic Dollar Program. Anne says that any funds that people can give are wonderful. And Community Helpers, along with the families that they aid, appreciate the help so much. Anne says it's what keeps them going, and if they didn't have people helping and continuing to donate, then they wouldn't be able to help as many people as they do. No matter what the circumstance, any donation can make a big impact. The relief on their face that there, you know, is actually going to be help for them. Um, you know, it 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 brings us to it almost brings us to tears as well. So it is a great program. It's a great resource for our community. And um, just want to encourage all the customers that can, you really aren't going to miss a dollar a month. If you want to donate to the Magic Dollar program. This month, uh, the month of November, our newsletter that we put out into our bills, it has got on the back of it a form that our, the customers can fill out to sign up and, you know, just send that back in with the bill or you can call in or you can send us an email, ever how you want to do that. Uh, we really would like to get a big push to get them some more funds as we're entering into the holiday season. For more information about the Magic Dollar Program, you can contact the Murfreesboro Electric Department at 615-893-5514 or call Community Helpers at 615-898-0617. Are you doing what you had envisioned for your life? The 12th Annual Chamber of Commerce's Women's Conference tackles that topic and how to lead a more fulfilling life without regrets. 
The conference invites women in the community to attend educational seminars with skilled speakers that promote the balancing act of being a better businesswoman. This year's keynote speaker, Carol Abersold, is well known for being the author and creator of the popular Elf on the Shelf book series, but she hasn't always been this successful. Carol said that after sending their manuscript for Elf on the Shelf to multiple literary agents, only one responded that she would be interested in moving forward with the project. She said she really believed in it. That literary agent then approached every publisher in New York City in an effort to get it published, and every single one of them turned it down. The literary agent assured Carol that she still believed in the book and urged her to self-publish, which was a whole new territory for Carol and her daughters. Carol spoke out about the importance of overcoming adversity and staying positive in difficult times. She herself had trouble getting her business off the ground, but it has now grown into a million-dollar company, with the Elf on the Shelf story continually becoming a popular tradition among more and more families each year. Be sure that you're determined, that you're an overcomer, that you have persistence, and that you do not get set in your mind exactly how something is going to happen because life happens to get in the way, but always keep the goal ahead of you. But what makes Carol such a truly inspirational speaker? is to hear her speak of the struggles that she and her daughters had to overcome through continuous dedication, hard work, and unfailing positivity. It was an uphill battle. One of Carol's daughters quit her job to focus on their endeavor, and the other sold her house and moved in to help with financing the project. They were all in. It took some time to get the project off the ground, but one day something very exciting happened. A friend called Carol screaming, You're on the Today Show! And sure enough, the Today Show was airing a segment about Elf on the Shelf. Carol's daughter was walking into their office at the time and said the phone started ringing off the hook, so much so that they had to ask friends from church to come in and answer the phones. And just like that, it took off. After listening to Carol's speech, the conference attendees were able to gain a new perspective and leave feeling encouraged, inspired, and motivated to venture forward and pursue their goals no matter how small or large they may be. One thing that Carol says she's recently learned is that everyone has somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And while some of those may not be of great importance, a lot of them consist of great ideas. Something else that she's learned is that the number one regret among people on their deathbed is that they did not live the lives that they wanted to, they lived the lives that they were expected to. Carol's ultimate message was that when you get to the end of your life, will you look back and see how many dreams that you had and didn't honor, or that went unfulfilled because of choices you made or didn't make? She said everyone has ideas, and some are really great ideas. You need to go ahead and do something with them. Carol may have taken a lot of risks and made a lot of sacrifices, but in the end, her gamble paid off. Will yours? Removal of the Browns Mill Dam means the river will soon be more accessible for recreational water activities. City TV's Steve Burris has more on the story. the Tennessee uh, Wildlife Resources Agency wrote a grant to the healthy the Tennessee Healthy Watershed Initiative uh, for $35,000 and we got that grant and we are so thankful uh, for that. Uh, we also got $24,000 those state wildlife grants and Bill Rees our, our biodiversity chief helped us uh, get that and so we leveraged the grant that we got uh, from THWI to, to start removing the dam here uh, on the east fork of the Stones River at Brown's Mill. The, the thing is why? You know, why, why would you want to, to remove a dam to, to start with? And, and, and how do you decide where uh, to remove that dam? And, and the East Fork of the Stones is a high priority stream. It's very important to the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. So we did pre-dam removal fish inventories here, and there's 35 species of fish. And, and hopefully with the removal of the dam, there'll be even more 
when we did the, the mussel survey here, there's only two species of mussels that occur here today. So with the removal of the obstruction of the dam, it is our hope that we will have more you know, species of mussel uh, return here. And so when we get, once we've gotten the dam down and the river is reconnected, we've got this you know, connectivity going again, hopefully this, this, the diversity of the mussel species uh, will, will come back. You know, when we first started talking about removing the dam, we, we had the, the idea of removing the dam, but it was a Stone River Watershed Association. Well, what about access to the river for folks in the, in the future? So it was it was them that started you know thinking about you know making this ramp to the river a much more reasonable slope so that folks could have public access here uh, in the in the near future. Um, once we got ready to take that dam out, uh, we had to, to find a contractor. And our contractor for this was Markham Excavation, uh, Jerry Markham. And, and he got in there and just very carefully removed that dam and nothing else. And he did it with such skill and such tact and, and such a soft touch that we were, we were amazed at what he could do. Because, you know, the river is just looks like a natural river now. And the jetty is here uh, to give paddlers that do come in a, 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 a nice, smooth, you know, river to, to get into, calm waters to start their, their float. Hopefully, we can have public river access at this site uh, in the, the near future. Just as Brown's Mill in the, in the late 1800s was an important part of, of Rutherford County, you know, sustaining the residents that, that lived here, uh, the removal of the dam is going to mean just as much to those folks that live in Rutherford County today. Uh, if, you're, if you like to boat or, or kayak or canoe or, or get out and, and wade a stream, you know, you're going to be able to do that now in this, in this reach of the Stones River and you're going to be able to see a lot of different wildlife along, uh, along the way. When we first started talking about removing this, I, I, I was kind of wondering how long it would take River Otter to find this part, a part of the stream. Pandy said they were out here planting these trees last week, yesterday, and there were River Otter at the, at the end of this slope here, so they, they're already here. Uh, the fish, I'm sure, are moving freely up and down that and and like Pandy said that with those fish are going to come the the new colonization of, of mussel species along this reach of the river. These kind of things don't happen without committed citizens. That's our public, that's our partners, that's our state agencies. It cannot happen and this is an important step in establishing the integrity of this river and also honoring the history of what this site had stood for for a long time. And I want everybody to know that the Stones River Watershed Association is really committed to um, just adopting this site as a, an example of what we need in our cities across the state. I'll be really quick and say we're just overwhelmed with how much different this looks now. We're so glad. Two quick things. Uh, I assure you we're going to use this as a recreational opportunity for years to come. Kids will. Uh, learn how to paddle here, get a lot of experience, and hopefully uh, you know, engage in a lifelong passion that a lot of us have. So we're, we're appreciative of that. We thank you for that. Uh, the second thing really quick is we're excited. You see all the danger signs over here. It says danger, danger, danger. Um, those are going to be replaced here in the next two weeks. So we're really excited about that. Uh, it's safe. Thank you so much. Like I said, we saw the otters out here yesterday, and uh, it was just such a pleasant uh, view from up here that we've never had before. Uh, and we're, we're overly pleased with how it turned out and excited about the future. And we just appreciate it so much and just really do look forward to the future of this uh, area. So thank you. With the holiday season comes the frightful frosty weather. Here's a few winter weather safety tips for the holiday season. With freezing temps come fear of frozen pipes in your home. Murfreesboro Water and Sewer provides some very simple steps to better prepare your home. We've had some frigid temperatures in just the past few weeks. And we would like to give you some tips on how to protect your home. And we'll take a walk around the home and give you some ideas as to what you can do to protect your home. First and foremost, you need to unhook all garden hoses from your outside spigots. After you get the garden hose disconnected, then you will need to put a protective covering over the outside spigot to help protect 
the cold air from getting to it. Next, we'll want to move to your crawl space vents. You want to make sure all your crawl space vents are closed. Then you want to find your crawl space door. Make sure it's closed and secure. This will prevent the air from being able to circulate under the house and take any heat that has accumulated under there and freezing your pipes. If you experience a loss of water during the cold weather, first you will need to call the Murfreesboro Water and Sewer Department. Allow us to come out and check your meter. Make sure the meter is not frozen. Um, if it is, we will then thaw it out. If you still are experiencing a loss of water after that, then you'll need to get a hold of a plumber or someone to help you thaw the pipes on your side of the meter. If you do feel that you have a frozen meter, please call us at 893-1223. As we move into the home, there's a couple of tips that you can use to help keep your pipes from freezing. First off, at night or during the day, you'll open your cabinet doors. This allows heat to get under the cabinet to keep your pipes from freezing. Other ways is to start your faucets. Let them have just a slow, small stream, the hot and cold, the hot not as much as the cold. Uh, this allows the water to run through the pipes and this helps prevent freezing. Another helpful hint would be if your water heater is in your garage, cracking the door, the exterior door going into the garage will allow heat from the house to go into the garage to keep it from freezing. You also could purchase a insulated cover that will surround your water heater and keep it from freezing also. Another good step to take inside the garage, which helps the entire home, is use insulating panels on garage doors. We would like to give you some other helpful hints for protecting your home, caulking your windows, glazing the windows, making sure they're secure and tight on your front doors, back doors, any exterior door. You would like to have, uh, make sure the weather stripping is good. Underneath the door, you may want to add a sweep to it to close that part of the doors. If you have any questions at all, you feel free to give us a call. Our office number is 848-3209. After nearly 30 years of service to Murfreesboro, one of the city's department leaders is retiring. Joseph Adelot will be leaving his post as planning director this month. Adelot served the planning department during a period of significant growth within the city. Since beginning work in 1984, the city's population has more than doubled in size, from less than 50,000 residents to well over 100,000. City Manager Rob Lyons says the city will conduct a nationwide search for a new planning director. In the meantime, assistant to the city manager, Shannon Logan, will serve as interim director until a new planning director is hired. Mitchell Nielsen schools are bringing TPAC to the borough as the school has received a student ticket funding grant from the Tennessee Arts Commission. This will bring the Nashville Opera to their campus for a special performance of Jack and the Beanstalk on February 5th. Sportscom is once again hosting a holiday lock-in from December 12th at 7 p.m. to December 13th at 7 a.m. This is a great opportunity to let kids enjoy a night of fun and games while parents can shop for any last-minute gifts. Ages 8 to 15 are welcome to attend and there is a participation fee of $20. The Murfreesboro Christmas Parade will be held at 2.30 p.m. on Sunday, December 14th. It will begin at the corner of East Main Street and Middle Tennessee Boulevard and travel down East Main around the Court Square and finish at Walnut Street. The Polar Plunge will be held on Saturday, January 3rd, beginning at 8.30 a.m. Participants are encouraged to bring non-perishable foods to benefit the Murfreesboro City School Family Resource Center to partake in the plunge. Pre-registration is not required, but will be available at Sportscom beginning on December 1st. City offices will be closed on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and they will also be closed on New Year's Day. Plus, don't forget that Murfreesboro City Schools will be on winter break from Monday, December 22nd through Friday, January 2nd. Well, that's it for this edition of In the City. For more information about the City of Murfreesboro, just head on over to our website at murfreesborotn.gov. And if you want to watch a specific story you've seen today or catch up on some of the latest city news, you can always visit the City of Murfreesboro's YouTube channel. Happy holidays, everyone. Hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. 
I'm Callie Durham. Until next year, we look forward to seeing you in the city.